Thank you very much for that kind introduction. I am indeed here to talk to you about regional anesthesia for the obese patient. I have a few disclosures, none of which will impact on my ability to deliver this talk. Uh, I will be using QR codes throughout the presentation, so please scan that QR code to go to the relevant link. And in fact, this QR code will take you to my SlideShare account where the slides will be held. So I've got to say at the outset, I do feel a little bit uncomfortable. Why do I feel uncomfortable, you might ask? Well, it's not easy to talk about obesity. I'm very aware of the potential of fat shaming or the stigma associated with talking about weight and also the potential to inadvertently use offensive terminology. So I was really grateful when I saw that Sober had taken this on with recent guidelines on consent for the patient with obesity with some really great useful tips in there. So there's a QR code to that document. So what we can say from the outset is that the patient living with obesity, regional anesthesia may be beneficial. Um, it certainly can be challenging to perform and it may require multiple attempts. And when you use ultrasound, it may not necessarily be that easy. That's just to give you kind of a frame upon which we are gonna subsequently talk. We all know about obesity definitions. Certainly this society will know it, so I won't dwell any more other than to say it's a spectrum or a range between overweight and super obesity. Now, clearly, this is a major issue. And if you look at the statistics for England, a greater proportion of our population are obese and morbidly obese. And certainly this is something that has got worse over time. And actually, if you look at that population group between 45 and 74, over 30 percent of our English population are obese. So despite how I feel about this, it's important that we talk about why regional anesthesia may have a role in obesity, what techniques we can use, how we might perform them, and then along the way to discuss some tips and tricks. So let's start off with why uh, regional anesthesia may be beneficial. So certainly um, in patients with obesity, there may be an issue with airways or difficult airways. And if you are able to perform a regional anesthetic, you can avoid airway manipulation or certainly minimize the amount of airway manipulation required. And therefore, if you can avoid a general anesthetic in these patients, they often have associated comorbidities with a cardiovascular system, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, and also um, diseases such as diabetes. So avoiding a general anesthetic in this population can be useful. Certainly, regional anesthesia allows you to use less opioids. And in the context of a patient living with obstructive sleep apnea, it can be a great benefit to minimize use of opioids and also re reduce the chance of post-operative nausea and vomiting, get the patients up and about. There's clearly a risk of thromboembolic disease, mobilize them faster and less disturbance of the cardiovascular and the respiratory system. And also there is evidence of a reduction in morbidity and mortality. Now, what happens if you can't perform a regional anesthetic as a sole mode of anesthesia? Is there still a role? Well, clearly there is, because reducing opioid use means that you can reduce nausea and vomiting, and actually less time in hospital and less time in the post-anesthesia care unit. So there's still a role. Whenever you are performing um, regional anesthesia in patients with obesity, there are a few other things to bear in mind with regards to the epidural space. CSF volume and the risk of a higher spinal. And also you've got to think about positioning of the patient with regards to peripheral nerve compression. Um, and also the coexistence of other comorbidities such as diabetes mellitus can mean that they are at in risk, increased risk of nerve damage uh, and nerve injury. So consider these factors before performing a technique. So what about what techniques can we can be used? Well, clearly nothing is impossible. Certainly, if you use ultrasound and use the correct techniques, anything is possible. And this is a, an image of one of my colleagues, a previous sober member using a nice cart based machine on himself. But you can also use these portable handheld devices. So we need to think about when I think about regional anesthesia in this population, I think about the techniques where you've got problematic landmarks such as spinal and epidural the whole host of standard regional anesthetic techniques, which we'll all be familiar with, and then some of the newer regional anesthetic techniques, such as the erector spinae plane block and the pain block. And these all have a role um, in these patients. So let's start off by talking about how. So I'm gonna talk about how to perform regional anesthesia by discussing some generic issues first, and then breaking down those techniques. So in terms of generic issues, it's really important before you do any of these techniques, you establish intravenous access and full monitoring. And intravenous access is not always as easy as it sounds. You've got to think about positioning the patient for the block, but also positioning the patient for surgery. Do you have the correct equipment and the correct supports? I would urge you to think about whether you need to use sedation. If you do, be cautious with administering the amount of sedation used, because if you're 
moving the patient in order to place a block, you then got to move them back at the end of the block. We need to think about the appropriate ultrasound probe, and I'll talk about that in a while, as well as thinking about needle vis visibility and maybe using echogenic needles. Thinking a little bit more detail, uh, detail it's worthwhile thinking about having the correct amount of assistance in order to help you to um, retract tissues when you're performing these techniques. And certainly think about using a nerve stimulator in addition to ultrasound. And if possible, rather than do a much more proximal and deeper block, why don't you move further down? So instead of doing an auxiliary brachial plexus block, can you manage with just distal forearm blocks? And likewise, pop the teal versus ankle blocks. And again, we need to think about adjusting the gain depth and the focal point, which I will cover shortly. So when you're ultrasounding through adipose tissue, often the more adipose tissue that you have means that the neural structures will lie deeper within the tissue. And we know that ultrasound beam gets attenuated with the more distance that is traveled. Um, and certainly the ultrasound beam travels at an uneven speed in adipose tissue. And that coupled with the speckling and clutter artifact means that you get a degraded, often grainy image. So you can do a few things. Number one, position your picture appropriately within the screen. You'll see here we've only got two and a half centimetres of depth, so clearly increasing the depth to make sure you've got the target within the centre of the screen. Um, you'll often need to turn the gain up and you might want to use an auto gain function or time gain compensation to focus the gain at the point that you're interested in. Many of the newer machines have a focal point, so adjust the focal point to the area of interest. You've got to think about the probe that you use. Often it's better to use a lower frequency scanning range so that the ultrasound beams can penetrate deeper. And that may mean using a curved array probe. And if you can, switch it to a penetration or lower frequency mode and use the heel in probe tilt that will allow you to visualize the needle in parallel to the beam. What do I mean by that? Well, here you go. You put a bit of pressure on some tissue and try to needle a structure right next to the probe very deep. The ultrasound beams hit the needle and they scatter away from the probe. If you use the heel in probe tilt and enter from a little bit further away from the probe, you actually introduce your needle much more parallel to the beam and you get a clearer visibility of that needle. So let's start off by talking about central neuraxial anesthesia. Clearly, it can be worthwhile thinking about positioning. How are you going to position the patient to start the block? How are you going to be able to palpate those structures? What needle length do you use? If you don't have a successful block, you'd have to convert to a GA in often um, um, suboptimal conditions. And also, if you're going to place a catheter, these catheters can often dislodge. So I want to draw your attention to this paper by Keijin and groups uh, and colleagues. They compared ultrasound spinals versus landmark spinals, and they found that actually the first attempt success rate using ultrasound to find the space was twice as high as the landmark group. And actually, fewer needle insertions and fewer passes they were so convinced that actually an interim analysis meant that they stopped the study early. So use ultrasound, it makes a difference. There's some great ultrasound spine resources. I wanna to talk to you about this paper from Harry Kalagra and colleagues, which talk about the couple of views that you need to generate in order to get a good view of the spine. And also there's great video by Ki Jin and that link will take you to his YouTube channel in this particular video and some tips and tricks in order to um, image the spine appropriately. But the main things I want to focus on is saying that actually it's worthwhile scanning regularly in patients of all sizes. And as a minimum, if you're going to perform a central neuraxial block, identify the level that you're going to be placing the block in, identify the midline, and remember, we often have to apply pressure to generate the image. And if you measure the space at that point, it will underestimate. So just before you're ready to measure, release the pressure, allow the tissues to relax, and then that will give you a true estimate of the depth of your space. What about upper limb? When I think about upper limb regional anesthesia techniques, I think about shoulder separate from the elbow and hand. The shoulder techniques, mainly interscaling. I put phrenic in brackets there to remind me to say that if your patient cannot tolerate a phrenic nerve block, you will need to think about some alternatives. And all of the rest of the brachial plexus is accessible to you for elbow and hand. If I was to put my money on it, I'd say interscaling is a pretty safe bet for shoulder. Um, an auxiliary nerve block plus or minus peripheral nerve blocks make sense. Now, there have been some papers looking at interscaling, supraclavicular and auxiliary brachial plexus blocks in patients with um, obesity. And what have they said? In summary, they all say that these blocks take a little bit longer to site, but maybe not that much longer. Maybe the blocks are a little bit less complete, but generally it's okay. 
when you are positioning a patient, certainly for accessing the neck and the upper part of the brachial plexus, it makes sense to place a bolster underneath the spine to kind of lift the spine forward, turn the head to the contralateral position and put the arm out of the table. And that opens up that space for the interscaling, supraclavicular, infraclav, for the auxiliary and for the peripheral nerves. And certainly, if you sometimes challenge to place a, a, a probe into the interscaling groove, what you could consider doing is placing the patient in the lateral position, the tissue falls out of the way, and that's a much easier way to cite the block. But sometimes it's just tough to cite a block. And if you use this patient as an example, interscaling, one might be able to do with the lateral position, supraclavicular, I think would be challenging, infraclavicular, I think would be challenging, but actually auxiliary brachial plexus block might not be that bad because they tend to, those structures tend to be much more superficial. So in summary, the shoulder, if they can tolerate phrenic nerve block, low volume interscaling, plus or minus a catheter, if not, look at the alternatives. For distal upper limb, you've got to decide which of those techniques you're more comfortable with. I've never been let down by auxiliary, but don't forget peripheral nerves. What about lower limb? So for hip surgery, this again is slightly contentious because some surgeons don't want regional anesthesia and actually they do a really great job of infiltration. Others will insist on a spinal plus or minus opioids. And then you've got a whole host of the other techniques available. The femoral nerve block, which of course impacts mobility, as well as the fascia iliaca or the pain block. For knee and foot surgery, you've got the proximal femoral or the distal adductor canal. And then again, you've got popliteal being proximal or the ankle block and the spinal as well. So these techniques are all available to you. And um, when patients have looked at the sciatic nerve block in patients with obesity, what they've determined is actually, if you were to identify the nerves, the sciatic nerve just after it's bifurcated into the tibial nerve and common perineal nerve, it's often easier to identify the nerves because they lie much more superficial and the nerve block onset is faster and more reliable. What about positioning for popliteal block? You can either pace the patient supine and have the leg elevated, or you can turn the patient into a lateral position, use a long enough needle, and actually this is one of those techniques which is not as hard to sight as one might think it might be. Um, when you think about the femoral nerve block, of course, we've got to think about the abdominal panis, and it may be that we need to do something clever to retract the tissue out of the way. Um, and also, but actually accessing the adductor canal is not too much of a problem, but certainly retracting that tissue makes things easier. So for hips and knees, I think you need to have a balanced discussion with your surgeon and the patient. It may be that doing something like a bony landmark based pain block for anterior capsule pain may be beneficial in combination with local infiltration, or maybe your surgeon's just happy doing local infiltration, or you wanna get a spinal in. The knees, you've got to have that discussion between whether you wanna get the patient up and mobilizing it, which, in which case femoral nerve block's not that great, and maybe you have to accept the adductor canal, or if it's really important for you to get decent analgesia, maybe doing a proximal femoral nerve block is worthwhile doing. So that's a discussion between you, the patient and the surgeon. And for foot and ankle, you've got that choice between a reliable popliteal plus or minus adductor canal for the saphenous and doing an ankle block. What about chest? When we think about chest, we've got the old blocks, the thoracic paraversal, thoracic epidural, and the newer blocks, the erector spinae plane, serratus plane, pex, and the MTP. Now, I think out of those two, probably thoracic paraversal has more of a role. And the newer blocks, the erector spinae plane block and this MTP, which is midpoint between the transit process and the pleura, may well have a role. This is a patient of mine from not so long ago. I was greeted with in the morning of surgery. You can see intravenous access was a little bit of a challenge. Um, but I'm going to show you the difference between thoracic paraversal blocks between her and a patient who was slightly slimmer. So on the left hand side, this is a patient with a BMI of less than 30. You can see that needle in plane and a pleura drop relatively straightforwardly. If you look on the image on the right, you can just about make out the pleura and a shadow of the transverse process. And now with the sequence of images, you'll see over time that pleura gets just dropped and displaced. But seeing the needle get there was a challenge in those videos. So I think for chest, paraversals may be challenging, but they're certainly reliable. Think about the lateral position and transverse in plane. But there is a role for doing a sort of a paravertebral by proxy technique with these other techniques. And pecs and serratus may be possible, but sometimes watching it unzippering can be problematic. Trunk and abdomen, uh, we've now got the classic thoracic epidural again, um, and the spinal and intrathecal opioids versus these newer fascial plane blocks, the rectus, the tap, the ESP, and the QLB.
And I think actually that spinal opioid is very difficult to, to get away from. If you can get a spinal in with a decent amount of opioid in these patients, it can be beneficial, but that is a role for the fascial plane blocks. What about the evidence? This um, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis with trial sequential analysis by uh, Grappa and colleagues showed that actually tap block in bariatric, uh, bariatric surgery did have a big difference. And certainly there is a role for that. But also back in 2017, this paper by Ki Jin showed that actually erector spinal plane block may well have a role in bariatric surgery. There were two cases where it was used as a rescue block and one as a preoperative block, and it certainly had a beneficial role. So the summary for the abdomen is, I think spinal opioid has a role, think about the risk and benefit. Tap blocks definitely have a role, and there may be a role for ESP and rectus, but we just don't have the evidence yet, but certainly they're relatively safe. Here is a summary slide of all of my thoughts. This will be available on the slides afterwards, but you'll see it's interesting. Many of these block ones correlate with the REK plan A blocks, so not a coincidence. What about drug doses? I think if we were to use total body weight, that clearly wouldn't be a good idea. So what seems the most sensible, despite the fact that data is lacking, is to use lean body weight when calculating the dose of local anesthetic. Um, and in terms of working out the lean body weight, I can never do it on the top of my head. There are a few online calculators that you can see from these QR codes here. So let's summarize, we're right at the end of it. Now, as my patient who I showed you earlier would say with a bilateral thumbs up here, um, regional anesthesia has a role in patients living with obesity. Um, always consider the risk benefit. Think about positioning the patient for the block and for surgery. If you can avoid deep blocks, do, but certainly try and use blocks with minimal um, side effects. Consider using dual guidance, so peripheral nerve stimulator to help you identify those structures. Use echogenic needles or needle guidance software where you have it, certainly longer needles. Remember that heel in probe tilt uh, maneuver. For drug doses, use lean body weight. And if possible, consider using non-invasive ventilation if they're gonna be having a wake surgery. Uh, and don't forget that it's not all about region anesthesia. Use some multimodal analgesia as well. Thank you very much. My slides are available on that QR code and this video will be posted on my YouTube channel as well. I can't finish without reminding you about the REUK ISURA meeting next May in Edinburgh. Please do register, um, but that's all I've got time for. Many thanks.